Let me say something obvious. I spent my, my whole life navigating the issues of race. As a young black preacher in the Deep South, I experienced kindness and hospitality while witnessing the cruelty that accompanies deeply embedded seeds of racism. I've lived through a period of national reckoning, the civil rights movement that killed its leader, Martin Luther King Jr. But I also spent hours with his father as he talked about the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ. When I asked him in the early 1980s about the cruel killing of his son and even his own wife to assassin's bullets, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. told me, how can we not forgive when we've been forgiven so much? So, so how do we confront the complexities of race in America in a way that recognizes the good that our differences bring, the, the richness that is the tapestry of a society that invites everyone, who embraces our values, that is, to sit at the table of brotherhood, but how do we also understand the need to repent of the persistent sin of racism that's at the root of generations of injustice? Today, one of America's leading theologians, a pastor from the Deep South who leads an institution that trains pastors for ministry, Reformed Theological Seminary, Dr. Ligon Duncan, is with me on State of Independence. Stay with us. Dr. Ligon Duncan is Chancellor of Reformed Theological Seminary. He served as the senior pastor of the historic First Presbyterian Church in Jackson, Mississippi for 17 years and is the co-founder of Together for the Gospel, an annual gathering of pastors and church leaders from some 25 denominations, all 50 states and 62 countries. For some, a conservative white Presbyterian pastor from the South may be an unlikely guest for this topic. But after you hear his heart, I think you'll see why he's precisely the man to lead the conversation. Welcome, Dr. Duggan. Duncan, it is so good to have you. I've been so excited about having you on the show. Well, it's a delight to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, you, you have such a, uh, have had such a marvelous career, and uh, you were born in South Carolina. I sure was. You know, born. a lot of folks uh, in the North figure, well, if you're born in South Carolina, you know, moving to Mississippi is, you know, you know like moving next door. And kind of is, but I guess maybe it was a, a transition for you as well? It was, very much so. The, the, the people in the state of Mississippi tend to stay there, and so it's a very insular community, and it takes a long time before they trust you. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I actually learned a lot about that. I came to Mississippi from Scotland, and the Scottish people are pretty similar. You know, they, <laughs> and until they trust you, you know, you're going to be on the outside of things. And uh, so it, it was a real education for me coming to Mississippi and frankly learning about my own history that I had not paid as much attention to in the past. Now, don't you come from like eight generations of, of elders in the Presbyterian I, Church? I or? do. Yeah. Um, I do. My family goes way back in the history of the state of South Carolina. To, before South Carolina was even a British colony, there were Duncans in South Carolina that had come. And what from number of Ligon Duncan are you? Well, I am. I am. I am. I am Jennings Ligon Duncan the third. <laughs> Uh, and my son is the fourth, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. <laughs> and, and then, so you, you, you go to college, you go to seminary, uh, you, you end up going to Scotland, I think, where you got your doctorate. I did. I went to the University of Edinburgh in Scotland and finished in 1990 and then was called by the president of Reformed Theological Seminary to come teach in Jackson, Mississippi at the Jackson campus. And it was the first time I'd ever been to Mississippi in my life. Uh, what year was that? 1990. I actually interviewed in 1989, November of 1989, and then came back in June of 1990 to begin teaching while you were in the White House. That's right. I was, uh, <laughs> I was there doing my work in the White House. And, and actually, I came to Mississippi uh, right around that time. I was invited to be the commencement speaker at Cahoma Community College in the Delta. I'd never been, I'd, I'd lived in Alabama. I'd been the chaplain at Talladega College in Alabama, but I, I hadn't been to Mississippi. And I, I came to Mississippi for that. And, and I was in the Delta region. Which is a whole nother country. Yeah. Uh, folks from the Delta are very proud of it. And uh, it's, it's like no other place on earth. And I got to be friends with people in Yazoo City and Cleveland and Greenville and Greenwood and all up and down the Delta. So you were in a very special part of Mississippi. Yeah. Now tell folks, uh, our, our listeners, our viewers, uh, where, where you're located. I am in the state capital of Jackson. 
Uh, and the seminary is located so far west in Jackson, we're almost in the little town of Clinton, Mississippi. We, were, we started in the middle of the Civil Rights era. Uh, people gave us a horse farm way out in West Jackson, Mississippi, and we planted a campus out there and started a seminary. Now we're located in eight cities in seven states, and we're working in two foreign countries as well. Wow, so your heart has been just a to, to, to be God's person, to, to share the Word, to teach the Word? Indeed. I, we, we're a seminary that's committed to the Word of God and to the Gospel and to the Great Commission. And I've been, you know, I, it's been my joy to teach there for over 30 years now, but I've learned a lot while I was there. And nothing more important than the relationships that I have, have been able to form with people. I think when people meet you, they get right away that you, you have, you can see Christ in you but you're, by your love for people. Uh, it just it just it just comes out of you, you know. When when m most people, especially people in in other parts of the country, uh, hear that you're in the state of Mississippi, uh, they they make assumptions about that. They make assumptions about what that means. Uh, you know, they've seen movies and the like. I, I worked in the White House. Two of my good friends from Mississippi, uh, um, uh, Craig Ray, of course, and and and, uh, and Jake Palmer. Um, uh, uh, I just have always known to be two wonderful guys. They happen to be white and yep. from Mississippi, and uh, and they were my friends and still are my friends uh, all these decades later. We all worked in the White House together, and I didn't know they were from Mississippi uh, until they told me they were, and then they just loved me for me, and I loved them for them, and and I never the thought never crossed my mind that because they were from Mississippi that they might be a racist. Right. I don't think it's fair to, to make that statement about anybody, to, right. to assume that anybody because of where they're from is a racist. Uh, but, but clearly, it's not fair. I wouldn't want sure. somebody to make an assumption about me based on where I was born or, or how I look right. or, or the color of my skin to, to say that I'm a certain way. Uh, so, so, but when people hear Mississippi, oftentimes they think of themselves, you know, well, boy, that's a place where there are real issues with race and where yeah. black people have not been treated well for a long time. How, how do you, how do you, what do you think about that? Well, that's good. I mean, and of course that's very true. I mean, the, 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 those assumptions that people have are true. I will say the people of Mississippi, I've never met people like them anywhere on earth. And, and, and both my black friends and my white friends in Mississippi have made an indelible uh, impression on my life. And, you know, surprisingly wonderful things have been happening in the state of Mississippi for a long time. So, for instance, when I first came to Mississippi in, the 19, in 1990, in the early 1990s, a movement of black and white Christians called Mission Mississippi started. And uh, Tom Skinner, an oh, African-American yeah, pastor man. from New York, and Pat Morley, a white pastor who's now in Florida with a men's ministry, were dear, dear friends, and they came together and they started doing, um, you know, basically uh, rallies around the state of Mississippi and in the biggest uh, football stadium in Jackson and p trying to pull black and white Christians together and to bridge some of the racial divides uh, that have haunted us in the state. And tremendous things happened in, in those days. And so there have been, there's a lot of quiet good news. You know, during, during the national um, crisis in the, in, the, in the wake of the George Floyd killing, Mississippians, black and white, came together and we, we removed the Confederate battle flag off of the, the state flag uh, for the first time since 1894. And it, and it took black and white Christians working together to do that. And I'm not sure the rest of the country even yeah. noticed that happening, yeah. but there are wonderful people there. John Perkins is somebody yeah. that I'm sure that many of your listeners know. John has been a dear friend and an encourager for a year. Dolphus Weary is another wonderful leader. The Lord has given many outstanding leaders. Maybe our most famous graduate at Reformed Theological Seminary is Dr. Jerry Young, who's the president of the National Baptist Convention, the largest African-American denomination in grad, the country. Huh? He's an RTS grad twice. He did his master's degree and his doctor, uh, doctorate with us in Jackson. And so Jerry is a dear friend. And so, you know, th there are good, good things happening along with the hard things all the time. And uh, it, it's always the people, isn't it? It's the people that change you. And it's, 
it's certain people being brave to step out, to cross barriers, to make friendships, to make alliances, to work to make things better. That's how it always happens. What, what was the hardest thing? If you can think of, a, of, a, of an instance that might have been really hard for you, uh, that, that, that came to good, what would that well, be? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll just tell a story on myself, Joe. I, you know, I, I was hired to teach, among other things, ethics. And, and the ethics course was not only pastoral and church, it was social ethics. And uh, so I'm, I'm preparing my curriculum and uh, trying to figure out the things that we're going to study. Here I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a newly minted professor. It's the summer of 1990. And I think, oh, now what's, what kind of things? Well, we need to deal with uh, just war theory. And uh, we need to deal with that whole range of issues that surround gender, marriage, and sexuality. And uh, we, you know, we need to deal with abortion and you know, a whole variety of the things that anybody teaching ethics would think of. It did not occur to me, Joe, to have a component on racism. <laughs> Even though that was a continuing standing reality for so many of my students as they went out and served in the churches. And, and it was only through forming deep friendships with uh, black students and black pastors that I began to realize, okay, I have, I have been in a bubble where I didn't realize what was going on around me. And I need, I need, to, pay, I need to go back and pay more attention to my own life, and then I need to pay more attention to these things now. So I, I would say I was, um, I, was, I was shaken by the realization of my own ignorance because of friendships, when friends sort of let you into their lives and they tell you how things have been for them. And you, I suddenly realized, okay, my life was not like that. I didn't face the things that you have faced and that you face now and then, of course, when you when you have a friendship, you care about your friend. You 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 want their well-being. So the things that hurt them, they hurt you, and the things that they aspire to, you want them to be able to achieve. And so, really, it was the kindness and, frankly, the patience and forbearance of loving black Christian friends that just that they opened my eyes to a really important part of life for our whole country and culture, but especially the southeastern United States with our history there that I needed to learn about. And um, I thank God for that. I really do. It, 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 it has changed my life. Well, it's eye-opening. You know, uh, it, it's funny how we're structured as human beings. You know, like, like most of us in the United States, we eat every day. And, and, and some of us too much, and certainly in my case, uh, I, I don't miss a meal, I mean three meals a day. And, and, and we know, yet still we know there's the issue of hunger in the world, but it's so far removed from us, it, it's not a real issue for us. And we don't give it a thought, you know. We, you know we, we watch it even on the news and we say, oh, pass the potatoes, you know. And while you're eating, you're watching about people dying of starvation. And it's not until you realize uh, or, or meet people who have, who have have been challenged by hunger, or who haven't had the capacity to buy food to eat, uh, or who've been in a situation like some of our guests on the show who've been in other countries and there was no food to buy, so you couldn't eat, do you realize, wow, I, I didn't even know, I didn't even realize, Lord forgive me for not being sensitive to, that, to the pain that folks are suffering in other parts of the world. And it's the same with this, it's, uh, if, you, if, if it's never happened to you, 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 you might not notice it. Sure. But, 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 but if, certainly if you're a person of color as I am, you, know, you, you, you live with it every day. It's uh, true. And, and, and so it's, it's so important. It's a, and it's a wonderful, beautiful thing when brothers and sisters in Christ say, you know what, I'm sensitive now, I'm listening. I, I didn't realize, tell me, tell me about your experience. Tell me about what you've had to undergo. And then tell me how together we can fix it. I, I love, uh, you form, what, what's the organization that you have? That Together you, for the Gospel. Wow. Yeah. Wow. How'd you form that? Well, really, out, again, out of friendships. Uh, uh, there were a group of four pastors that we were getting together on a regular basis. We were from different denominational backgrounds. Uh, two, one of them was a Baptist seminary professor uh, and president. One of them was a local church pastor at a Baptist church. One of them was a charismatic. Uh, and, and I was a, one of these, you know, stayed in the wool, uh, stark shirt Presbyterians. And, and yet we encouraged one another and we learned from one another and we helped one another in the Christian life life and in the ministry and we thought to ourselves how many pastors are out there and they don't have these kinds of friendships they're alone 
And so we, we decided we'd start a conference, and we did in 2006, and I told everybody, nobody's going to come to this. And uh, three and a half thousand people showed up. And uh, we've, been, <laughs> we've been doing it every other year since that time, and uh, it, it's grown to 10 or 11 or 12,000 pastors gathering, and a lot of encouragement has come out of that. But again, it's friendships that, that drove that. Uh, we, had, we had common bonds in Christ. Uh, we loved the truth of God's Word. We loved the gospel. We were friends. And, and then the, the conference came out of that. What a different and sweet Christian spirit. I mean, you know, there, there are forces in, in the country and around the world that drive off of anger, you know, and they say, well, these things happened in the past and I'm angry. And, and, and yet in Christ, just like with Martin Luther King Sr., you know, his wife got shot and killed yes. in a, during a church service by a guy yes. who happened to be black, unfortunately. And, and instead of being angry about it, he, his attitude was, you know what, you gotta forgive, you gotta love, you gotta forgive. And, 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 and that spirit is... I totally agree, Joe. That, the, and let me say, for me, the power of forgiveness has been profoundly affecting on my life, and it's especially the forgiveness of my black Christian friends. Um, I, I, was at a, I was at a meeting of Christians where I had done some research about my own tradition and where we had, we had made grave, grave mistakes and sins and errors in this area. You know, I had people out of my tradition that were on white citizens councils that were committed to opposing desegregation and, and retaining segregation and had, had done things that were deeply damaging to African-American Christians in our city and community. And I was at a meeting and I, I just said, I, I want you to know, I, I, I know where I come from. I know what context I'm ministering in. And I want to, I want to say, I'm sorry. I want to ask your forgiveness uh, for what my, my people, this is, these are my people uh, that we've done this. And a godly, a godly woman who actually happened to be the, the, the aunt of the pastor at that church. The pastor at that church uh, grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. His father was a famous uh, pastor. His grandfather was a famous pastor at the Ferris Street Baptist Church, which is a very important Baptist church in the African-American community. This was his aunt. She came up to me after that meeting and she looked me in the eye and she said, I've never heard a white Christian apologize for the things that you talked about today. And she, then she said, and I want you to know, I forgive you. And she put her arms around me and I just mm. dissolved into a puddle of mm. tears. And I told, I told my friends, I, you, you don't know the power of the forgiveness in the black church. I mean, you just don't until you experience it yourself. And I, forgiveness is a, it's a healing thing. It, it immediately breaks down barriers. I was immediately safe with her and we could have talked about anything because she could have condemned me, yeah. but she didn't. She accepted me and she, she forgave me. And, um, and, and I, I've seen that happen over and over and over again. The power of forgiveness is something that Christians understand yeah. that nobody else really understands in that world. And it's the key to everything. Yeah, so powerful, so powerful. Um, how, how do we do this nationally? I mean, how do, how do we, how do we move, the, move the needle uh, forward? Well, I mean, don't you think it's harder to talk about this right now than it was maybe 15 years ago? I, I, I remember being at a, um, I was at a, uh, a, a national prayer breakfast in D.C. I bet you went to a gazillion oh, yeah, of those. Yeah. And uh, Roger Wicker was the, he was the Republican senator, senator. I can't remember who the, they always have a Republican and a Democratic senator sponsor it and do it together. Because Roger was there, he had, he had the Mississippi Mass Choir come and sing. He had a children's choir from Mississippi sing. There was a soloist from Mississippi who sang. And I happened to speak with John Lewis and Andrew Young at that meeting. And they were over the moon ecstatic. He said, I can't believe what's happening in Mississippi. I can't believe a Republican senator inviting these African-American choirs to sing. And there was a real sense of we've made progress, yeah, you know? Yeah. Well, fast forward since, you know, since Trayvon Martin in 2012, Michael Brown in 2014, 
everything that went along with the elections, then, you know, continuing things uh, up to George Floyd and, and on. And don't you, there's been a real national tension and polarization on how we respond to this that's made it harder to talk about race now than before. You know, sometimes even if you talk about it, you're immediately put into one category or another. You know, you're, you're woke or you're anti-woke. Right. You know, you're, you're this or you're that. Right. And so it actually, in our time, it takes a little bit of bravery, even for Christians to stand up and say, let's have a serious conversation about this and let's be constructive about it. Let's not, let's not lob grenades at one another. Let's actually try and figure out how we can work together. And I've certainly seen that happen at the church level. Uh, but we've, we've got a lot of work to do at the national level right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in just a minute, we'll have more with Chancellor of Reform Theological Seminary, Dr. Ligon Duncan. Stay with us. You're watching Joe Watkins' State of Independence on Lighthouse TV, positively different. Share your comments about today's program in the comment box at joewatkins.org. So we're back with uh, Dr. Ligon Duncan. Uh, he's the Chancellor and CEO of Reform, Reform Theological Seminary in, uh, in, Alabama, in Mississippi. Uh, not, I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, don't, don't say Alabama, you mean our Mississippi. Our cousins, our cousins yeah, yeah, over yeah, there in yeah, Alabama. Yeah, yeah. But no, this is, this is so wonderful and sweet. You know, this is a, you're right, it's harder in today's um, society to talk about race than it was even just a few years ago. Yes. And, and there's the fear that people have now being canceled. You know, right. uh, you, know you, you say the wrong right. thing or you tell people how you really feel and, and you, know, you can be canceled, so to speak. Correct. And nobody hears from you anymore. And, and, and so it, it, this is a very tricky environment, especially you know, with, 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 you know, with social media being what it is. Uh, it's just so easy for somebody to say something and, and to be taken out of context or to say something yes. that's, that's really not very nice and, and, and then that gets heard, and then we don't, we don't discuss it, we just you know, condemn that person. There's no That's chance wrong. for reconciliation, there's no chance for forgiveness, no chance for the person to apologize. You know, there, there, there's very little heart for that in the society right now. Yes. I, 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 I hope maybe, this is why I, 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 I'm loving having you on, on this program today, because of your heart, and because you're able to kind of speak uh, to, uh, to a, a wide range of, of, of people uh, who don't get to hear from you. Uh, and they don't get to hear from white pastors from the deep south who say, I, I, I cried when, when this black woman who is my Christian sister said, I forgive you yeah. for, for the sins of the people that came before you. Mm -hmm. We don't ever hear that. Yeah. You know, all we hear about, of course, is that there are atrocities Right. You know, and then and then we react to the atrocities, and then that's another march, you know, or or another fight, or another protest. But 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 the healing, what, the healing begins, I think, with God's people. It does, and I and I've seen that even happen at the at the state level in Mississippi when, you know, in the wake of the the George Floyd protest that popped up not just around the country but around the world. Uh, people in Mississippi who had actually been trying to change the flag for years and years and years said, okay, now here's a chance for us to address it again. There, there had been a little bit of movement after the killings at the Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina. When the Confederate flag came off of the state capitol grounds in South Carolina, there had been a little movement in Mississippi to deal, deal with that, but it, it didn't come about. And it was beautiful to see uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, but but people Christians come together and give leadership to that movement in the state, and I saw remarkable displays of generosity and forgiveness and trust in that process. The the Speaker of the House was a Republican, but many of the prominent uh, uh, pe people that were addressing this issue on the Senate side were Democratic senators, uh, some of whom, because I, I pray at the Senate often in Mississippi, they'll open the Senate with prayer, like we do it in, in the U.S. Uh, Capitol. Uh, and I, I get to know the various senators, and, and these people were working together like I'd never seen them work together before. And uh, a lot of it came out of their own Christian commitments. They, they believe that every human being is created in the image of God. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in His sight because they're created in the image of God. 
and they believe that it's, the, it's a Christian's responsibility to love your neighbor. So if you have a symbol that's dividing the state and that, uh, that demeans a, a significant proportion of your population, isn't it a good thing for Christians to come together and figure out how we can get that out of the way? And they did. And, uh, and, and, and it, was, it was just a beautiful thing to see what can be accomplished when people of goodwill are willing to do hard things. And I'll tell you a very interesting thing. The Democratic senators knew that the Republican senators were actually going to have the harder job of getting this passed with some of their constituencies. And so I, I saw Democratic senators stand up on the Senate floor and say, friends, I'm going to be praying for you in these next days because I know what you're up against in trying to explain this to your constituency. So I, you know, I, I got to be a little fly on the wall, Joe, and watch that. And, and you've watched a million processes like that in your life, but I got to kind of watch it up close and personal and see what Christians can do when they work together. Mm, beautifully said, beautifully said. I could talk to you all day. I really could. I, I, you, and I, I, I'd like for you, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but, but we're going to work with your staff people to get you back. I'd love to. Yeah, I'd yeah, love yeah, to, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, this is so special. Our thanks to, uh, to Dr. Duncan for thinking and praying through these tough questions and leading us through this difficult moment in American history. We'll be right back with our producer, Jeff Coleman, with closing thoughts. Learn more about Joe Watkins and the mission of this program at joewatkins.net. And tell Joe what you thought about today's program in the comment box. And now let's talk to our great producer, Jeff Coleman. Well, I think what we had hoped to have out of this program is exactly what we, we, Dr. Duncan delivered, which was when we talk about race so often, you're left in a complete state of despair. Yeah. Because you may have been convicted about an issue that you need to work on, but you have no idea on how to practically change your life or your pattern of behavior. Who do I say sorry to? Well, it wasn't me. It was generations above it. So it ends in confusion. What we have here is a roadmap which is it begins with personal relationships, yeah. um, your dinner table being configured a little differently, your lifestyle, where you walk, where you shop, maybe visiting different neighborhoods. In our home, that's how it has uh, it really changed our life and invited these rich relationships with people that didn't come from our neighborhood. Yeah. So. What, what, I just love the sweetness of the spirit, you know? I mean, it's a sweet spirit. I mean, yeah. it's the spirit of Christ. You know, where there's reconciliation and forgiveness. I just love it. It's all there. Uh, uh. Well, that's all the time we have for this week's program. I hope you're praying and thinking through the issue of race and what it means to see ourselves as God sees us. Send me a comment in the comment box at joewatkins.org. I'll read and respond to each one of you. Today's conversation with Dr. Duncan was, was part of our mission to equip you, equip you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as you love yourself. Maybe this episode has stirred you to make things right with someone you've heard, or maybe it's just what you needed to go next door to meet that neighbor. Whatever he's asking you to do, don't waste a minute. From America's first capital, Philadelphia, I'm Joe Watkins. God willing, I'll see you next week. What a blessing to have Dr. Duncan. Yeah. That's just powerful. Yeah. It's a uh, great way, I think, to open the conversation it will start a lot of yeah. conversations. Joe Watkins' State of Independence is a production of Lighthouse TV, positively different, made possible in part because of the support of viewers like you.